All right. What's the name of this message? Did you give it a name? Soul Snatcher. <laughs> Sounds sci-fi. <laughs> Try that one on for size. Sometimes on a plane, people are like, what do you do? I'm a soul snatcher. Can I change my seat? <laughs> it's okay to laugh. Some of you need to laugh a little bit. Desperately need to laugh. There's so much sorrow and sadness that let me write you a prescription. Laughter is good medicine. Dr. Hirschberg. All right. Right right before I got sick, you know, I felt compelled to write a book. I thought it was going to be very silly. I really did. The other books I spent time and meditated and prayed and did some research. This one was like written in. So I thought, ah, so silly. I called up Bernadette and I said, I wrote this book, Bern. It's like I wrote it in a few days almost. Why? She goes, it, it's your life. It's just what you've been doing for 35 years. So it just came out. It was going to be a short read. And the whole point was to help prevent people from dying without the Lord. That was the point. Being separated from the Lord and his light for all eternity. That was my desire. Do I want to put notches in my belt? Now, if that's what you want to do, no, no, no. I was prompted by the Holy Spirit, you know, to call these two publishers that have worked with me with the other books. And I asked them, how many books have been written to the atheist, to the agnostic, to the one who claims to be hurt by the church? You know that person, right? The church hurt me. And, um, and some people have been legitimately hurt by organized religion, right? You never think of how many people in organized religion hurt the guy up here? That you don't think of, right? <laughs> um, and then there's people that just hate God. I was like, how many books have been written to those people? And there were basically two, two, two out of the hundreds of thousands of books that Christians have written to Christians so they could become more Christian. Give them something to read. Information. I just went outside and said to a couple of guys, who was the guy with the six fingers and the six toes on each hand and each foot? They were like, uh, like I was testing them. They were like, uh, one said Goliath. I said, no, Goliath's son. I said, where's that? And I they weren't sure. And I said, Second Samuel 2021. And then I said, I'm going to ask you again, but this is the answer I want you to give me. Who cares? And I asked them again, who cares? If you know that, is that going to make you more flagrantly obedient? Is that going to help you win souls? But, but if you know where it is in Second Samuel... It's impressive, right? No, it's not. No, it's not. So two books. Um, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Anybody know that book? Anybody read that book? Norman Geisler. He is the apologist of our time. He's great at it. 448 pages. People can't watch a TikTok video if it's more than 30 seconds. Hey, hey, I know you hate God, but here's a 448-page book I'd like you to read. The other one, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Anybody read that? Yeah. Really? Why? Uh, <laughs> it's an intellectual book written by an attorney, and it's 880 pages. 880. So... It's been, this book has been translated into Spanish. Like I said, I thought it was going to be a very silly project. I was hoping I was hearing right. It's going to be distributed in Israel. And right now it's being distributed in prisons all over America. I don't want to be difficult. Listen, it is very easy for an evangelist to make people feel bad. Right? Right? Yeah, it's easy. It's easy for a soul winner to make 
other believers feel bad, right? I really have no desire to make you feel bad. None. But I have a desire to help you share the best news known to mankind, namely the gospel. Okay? That's my desire. I want you to be a, a force. I want you to be somebody who really annoys the enemy. Now, evangelism in the body is becoming as extinct as the dodo bird. Why? A lot of reasons. Because the world said, you can't do that. You can't talk about politics and religion. Well, I know a lot of you talk about politics. Boy, you get in those discussions, right? You're so politically astute. You don't know jack about politics. You don't even know what the council people are doing in Macon, but you know what the president and his cabinet are doing? <laughs> They're politicians. They're lying to you. They're professionally doing that. Our government is no more corrupt than the government in Kenya. The only difference is Kenya doesn't know how to do it professionally. So it's in your face. Let's, let's first just clear the air, just a few scriptures just to see how absolutely important sharing the gospel is, okay? Mark 16, 15 says, then Yeshua said to them, so this is the end of the ministry. He's going to ascend. He's leaving the building. And as his farewell, he says, as you go throughout the world, proclaim the good news to all creation. Do you notice it says as you go, not if you go? In other words, you're going to be going places. You know, you might be going to Jerusalem. You might take a trip to the diaspora. Share the gospel. You don't have to go to Honduras to share the gospel. Your neighbor might be unsaved. You know, the one you wave to but you don't really talk to. You know that guy, right? As you go. In other words, the Savior's goal Look, Christian, Messianic Jew, Messianic Gentile, there's all kinds of ridiculous names. You're a follower of Messiah, right? That's who we're following, right? Under a new covenant, right? You're a new covenant believer following Messiah, right? He's the only way to the Father, right? Right? He's the way, the truth, and the life, right? Right, 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 right? Come on, right? Right. His goal was world evangelism. Just spitballing here. Don't you think that should be your goal? Asking a believer to me to evangelize is like asking a person, do you breathe? In Israel, every single Messianic Jew is highly evangelistic. Why wouldn't they be? It's not impressive that they're doing that. It's basic. Matthew 28, 18, 20, you guys know this. You could probably quote it. Yeshua came and talked with them. Again, he's getting ready to split. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He had the authority, but now it was official. The Father made it known publicly. Therefore, go and make people from all the nations into Talmudin disciples, immersing them into the reality of the Father, the Son, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Now, everybody gets caught up in that. You can't teach them unless they're saved. Evangelism is the prerequisite to discipleship. And remember, I will be with you always. Some of you, I think, read this. Go into all the world, immersing them to the reality of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and remember to argue with other believers about who's right and who's wrong. Isms are, are denominations. Judaism, Messianic Judaism, Catholicism, Pentecostalism. I'm not interested in isms. I'm interested in Yeshua. Yeah. Yeah. 
As head of the new creation, Yeshua issued what is known as the Great Commission, right? That's what they call this, the Great Commission. These are no more than standing orders for all. Say all. 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 You, you might not be called to the office of an evangelist, but you are called to evangelize. This is a standing orders for all believers from the present time, 2,000 years ago, till his second advent. You don't have to evangelize when he shows up again. It's a little late. The commission does not assume world conversion. Nobody told you you've got to convert people. But preaching the gospel, the disciples were to see others become followers of Yeshua from every nation, from every tribe, from every people and tongue. I got to tell you something funny. Uh, three weeks ago, I was at a church. Now, you've heard me say before, I don't know, some of you remember, some of you don't, some of you don't even listen, so who knows. I always say you don't go fishing inside a building. You've heard that before? You know the meaning of that? I should, have, I should have explained. I thought it was that everybody would know. Meaning you don't share the gospel inside the church. You are the church and you take it to the streets and that's where you share the gospel. So I was at this church three weeks ago, real nice conservative church, beautiful people. And I said, you don't go fishing inside a building. And a guy comes up to me after service and he goes, you know, Rabbi, everything you said I agree with except one thing. And I said, what's that? And he said, you said you don't go fishing inside a building. I said, you don't. He goes, I'm a cop in Memphis, and I just arrested somebody last week for fishing inside the tank at the Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> so I said, okay, I stand, I stand corrected. Uh, Luke 19.10, notice this is all Yeshua talking, right? This is all the main guy that we're supposed to follow, right? It's not something I read on a website or not quoting a podcast. I like to quote him. For the Son of Man, just in case anybody was wondering, what are you here for? For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. In context, Yeshua is being criticized for hanging out with sinners. Stop that. Just go to a small group meeting. I'll, I'll tell you. He let them know emphatically that this was his very purpose for coming into the world. So as followers of Yeshua, that should be our mission statement. All right. Let me talk. It throws me off. Sorry. I have ADD. A church that doesn't seek to save the lost is a lost church. Acts 1.8, still Yeshua talking. I only have a few more verses. That's it. But you, he stops them because what do they want to know? They want to know when he's going to come back and set up his kingdom. Right? A lot of people want to know that. Sorry. You're not going to. There are guys on the internet. I've seen, I've seen it. Even people try to give me books. They spent their whole life, and they have figured out what day he's coming back. What Sukkot or what day of atonement. How could that be? How could they know what Yeshua says it's impossible to know? And then Yeshua says, I don't even know. <laughs> what? I've met some of these people. I go, you can't know. No, I did an extensive study. Well, you wasted your life. <laughs> so they want to know, but you will receive power. You want the power for what? What do you want the power for? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the power? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judah and in Samaria to the very ends of the earth. Yeshua is being 
uh, that, that he's suppressing their inquiry about the future. They want to know about the future. But what he wants to do is stress what's much more immediate. It still is immediate. Namely, to be witnesses. I'll just give you a couple more. Peter was a phenomenal disciple, very close to Yeshua, hung out with him for three and a half years every day. I think he would know what he's talking about. He says, treat the Messiah as holy, as Lord in your hearts, while remaining always ready, apologia, that's where we get the term apologetics, to give a reasoned answer, not, oh, this is my big bang theory. God said it and bang. What are you, three years old? <laughs> to give a reasoned, a reasoned answer. God's not asked us just to have faith in faith. We have reasons to believe. To anyone, anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. Yet, with humility, don't be a know-it-all, and always have a reverence to the message you're sharing. Peter tells us that the lordship of Yeshua should dominate every area of our life, our marriages, the stuff we read, the places we go. This verse is primarily referring to times when believers are being persecuted. That's what it, they're being persecuted. First century, everybody was persecuted. Because of their faith. But I'm telling you, this verse can be applied to everyday life. People at times will ask us questions about our faith, and this presents a wonderful opportunity. You know how many times when I go overseas and people just say, they don't, they're not being mean, they go, why are you doing this? And I go, oh, this is great. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so easy. Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel since it is God's powerful means of bringing salvation to everyone who keeps on trusting, to the Jew especially, but equally to the Gentile. Paul said he wasn't embarrassed to share the gospel with sophisticated Rome. Paul went to Rome. They were sophisticated. They were philosophers. They were brilliant orators. It didn't matter to him. First of all, he was just as brilliant. But he considered his brilliance and his intellect dung because he knew if the Holy Spirit moved, they were snatched. Nothing they could do about it. Even though the message proved to be a stumbling block to some and foolishness to others, he knew that God could save anyone who believes in his son. Last verse, Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, it's Chaim, and he who is wise wins souls. Rabbi, what the heck is that doing in the Old Testament? I know, it snuck in there. This is one of the greatest texts for soul winners in the Bible. It reminds us the promise Yeshua made to Peter that he would catch men. What a privilege it is. What a privilege it is to be used of God in doing a work that results in eternal blessing. So you can see easily with these just few verses, there's many more, this is our calling. And if we believe that it will truly in the last days, I hear people saying this all the time, Rabbi, you don't teach much about eschatology anymore. Uh, we're in the last days. Some of you are really up there in age. You're in your last days. And if you believe so much in all your eschatological study that we're in the last days, how come you're not aggressive at sharing the gospel? Okay, so I can just be a knucklehead and go, look, Yeshua said this, it's a command, you got to do it. End of story. I would like to show you why evangelism blesses literally the hell out of you and makes you happy. This is a win, 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 lose situation. God wins because he gets the glory. He wants none to perish. 
The person you're sharing with wins because you're planting seeds. You win because you feel purposed, and Satan loses. God wants you to enjoy your walk. He actually wants you to enjoy you, him being your father and you being his kid instead of complaining about every freaking thing there is. You're actually showing him you're not happy with him. Well, he's not enough. Oh, what did I do for you? I was there for my kids. My kids and I are crazy close. Plus, they are deathly afraid to lie to me because they think I have a direct line to God. <laughs> just yesterday, Lily, I don't know if you're watching, and she just called me and said, Dad, my, my computer's not working right. And I went, because you dropped it. The Holy Spirit told me. And she goes, yeah. I said, well, you're going to leave that part out? <laughs> you know? She goes, no, I was getting to it. I go, Really? But it, it said when you're not a happy believer. It would said me the most important thing for me with my kids was that they were happy. They're not taking their trophies into heaven. Who cares? Some of you had big trophies. Where, where are they now? What are they doing for you now? They're just stories, man, and they depress you. Because like, whoa, when I was young, I was, you're just depressing yourself. I mean, I could hardly walk. I'm not going to sit around, oh, I used to do triathlons. So that will depress me. I'm just happy I'm walking a little bit. So let me share some things with you, and then I got to skedaddle because I got a plane to catch. Boy, he sounds so important. <laughs> Doesn't he? I always wanted to say that. I used to go see these big shots. They go, I can't stay around. I got a plane to catch. I was like, wow. <laughs> He's got a plane. He must be so powerful that he could catch a plane. All right, number one, evangelism is an act of love. I mean, you shouldn't feel forced to love. We're called to love, right? Oh, Rabbi, you're going to do that love thing. I don't want to hear the love thing. Give me, give me some interesting knowledge that I can learn. How about you try to learn how to love other people? What about that one? That might be nice. I love God. I just don't like people that much. Then you don't love God. How can you say that? I didn't say it. The Bible did. It said, if you, if you don't love what you do see, you can't love what you don't see. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. What are you blaming me for? Rabbi, I don't like you today. I'm just giving you scripture. What do you, what do you want from me? Shoot the messenger? Love must be the divining, defining characteristic of every believer of Messiah Yeshua. You hear that? We possess the best news in the world, and it's love that propels us to share it with those who haven't heard. Love wants everyone to be saved and have a chance to respond to God's offer of salvation. Withholding news that could save someone's life is cruel. It's cruel. Therefore, those who truly love God will love the people whom he loves and came to save. Sharing the gospel, listen, is the most single, most loving thing you can do for people. There's nothing more loving. Nothing. Yeah, we buy clothes for people and shoe them. Why? That's the hook. There's plenty of people that do that without sharing the gospel. Number two, evangelism builds off faith. Who doesn't want their faith to be built up? How about I want more faith? I want more faith. Evangelize. Wait, I don't see the connection. Okay. Nothing helps us learn a subject like teaching it to someone else. Anybody amen to me? Ask any Sunday school teacher, any Sunday school teachers here? Any preachers here? Want to be preachers? Any homeschooling moms? Ask them. They know what I'm talking about. 
when we make it a practice of sharing our faith with those in our lives, we strengthen our own faith. Regular evangelism forces us to wrestle through the hard questions, sorry, find answers for ourselves and prepare to respond to the questions of others. The Bible tells us that we should always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us and to give a reason for the hope that we have. We prepare by studying God's word for ourselves. Studying God's word. Stop listening to somebody on the internet, you idiot. They haven't been tested. Where's their internal and external evidence? Where's their bibliographical evidence? Why are you listening to them about heaven when only Yeshua could tell you about heaven because he's the only one that came from heaven? When did the Bible become not enough for you? The disciples didn't have all those books. How did they do? They filled Jerusalem up with the gospel in less than a year. You know why? Because they had the power of God. And do you know why you don't? Because you went to Google University. Rabbi, you're really making me uncomfortable. You know, you think it's so easy to speak the truth. Why do you think everybody's lying to everybody? It's much easier to lie to somebody. When you speak the truth, you get some friends and you get some enemies. Try it. Read God's word. Listen to sound Bible teachers. Sound. And stay in close fellowship with Yeshua. Number three, evangelism provides eternal benefits. Yeshua encourages followers to store up treasures in heaven. The treasure consists of rewards for what we did on earth in his name for his glory. The parable of the unjust steward underscores the importance of doing whatever it takes to bring people to faith in Messiah. The Lord is coming back in his Father's glory. And his reward, his recompense is in his hand. And he's going to repay everybody for what they've done, not what they believed. You hear the saying, talk is cheap? There's a lot of cheap talk going around. Number four, evangelism is an overflow of the hope within us. When two people fall in love, they can't help but let everyone know around them. I mean, it's annoying sometimes, right? You like got that five friends and finally that one friend falls in love and he just can't stop talking about her. It's like, give it a rest, dude. They'll tell anyone who will listen about the wonderful person they're in love with. So if we fall in love with Yeshua, and that's a big if, we would not be able to contain ourselves. We would look for every opportunity to share him with others and tell them about the hope that is within us. Anyone who, look, listen, I'm out there sharing the gospel, but anyone who comes into my house is going to hear it, whether they like it or not. You came into my house. So this week I had this guy come in to do the pest control. And after he was done, I said, you have a few minutes? I know that you're busy. I don't want to intrude. Yeah. And this guy looked like he didn't know the Lord at all, but he actually knew the Lord really well. He told me he doesn't go to church, you know, the, the millionth person who doesn't go to church. Uh, you know, I love God, but... You know, I also love forsaking the gathering. I just, I just sharpied that out of my Bible. And uh, he told me that he got hurt from a pastor 25 years ago, said something I di he disagreed with. I said, he said something that you disagreed with and that's what caused you to run? Wow, you're a runner. So we talked for a while, talked for a while, sent him on his way. The next guy comes to the house to do a termite inspection. The guy looked like a little little Baptist kid, kind of. He looked strong, but um, I was like, ah, this guy's going to tell him he goes to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. So when he's done, I said, can we talk? He was a sniper in the Marines. So you have no idea how tough you got to be to do that. 
And he rides with the, anybody know the Pagans Motorcycle Club? Anybody members? <laughs> There's four motorcycle clubs in the world that are one percenters. There was a guy that said back in the 60s that 99% of all motorcyclists are pretty good, but one percenters are total criminals, murderers. So the Hells Angels, the Outlaws, um, the Banditos, and the Pagans. And he shows me his Pagan tattoo stuff, and I'm like, this is going to be good. <laughs> so he told me his whole life story. I mean, every single detail. Some awful things. And I said, look, you know, I, I need to share some things with you. So we talked for about an hour, and um, I said, you sound very intelligent. Obviously, you're a sniper, you know. They just don't pick anybody. I said, do you read? He says, yeah, I read a lot. I said, if I gave you a book, would you read it? If you don't, don't take it. I don't want you to take it. He said, no, I'll absolutely read it, and I'll get back to you. And so I gave him the book, and then I, everybody comes in the house, Bernadette and I, we tip them. I'm not trying to be a big shot. I just know they're not making big money. So we always tip them. 20 bucks to me is not going to change my life, but it makes, you know, gives them life. So he got all excited. I go, don't get excited. I'm not buying you. We tip everybody. You're not special. <laughs> but it was an interesting uh, meeting. I loved it. When he left, I felt totally satisfied and fulfilled. I felt as happy as you could feel. Last Saturday, I baptized two guys, and at the end of the baptism, the both gentlemen said to me, Listen, I really appreciate you taking time out. They called me. They want to be baptized. I really appreciate you taking time out to baptize me. I said, let me explain something to you. They said, we know it's your Shabbat. I said, I couldn't be any happier than I am right now. There's no room in my tabernacle for any more happiness. If you tried to give me more happiness, I couldn't take it. My happiness meter is off the page. And I called Bernadette on the way home. I said, I just baptized two of Tommy. She's like, you must be so happy. Number five, last, evangelism pleases the Lord. Who doesn't want to please the Lord? The believer's life must never be lived according to shoulds. Yet we tend to hear that word often in relation to Bible reading, to prayer, to going to church or synagogue and other believing practices. I should do that, but... I could just tell you, look, Yeshua said, you gotta evangelize, and we gotta evangelize, let's go to lunch, and you'd be like, I should really evangelize it tomorrow. But I want you to see the incredible benefit it is to you as a believer. We're bored, so we study. There's nothing greater than talking to people about the greatest thing ever. The saving grace of God through his son Yeshua. There's nothing greater than that. You should spend a little time at Golgotha every day of your life. It's a game changer. God's children will naturally want to please the Heavenly Father. It is their greatest delight, right? I'm talking to his kids. Teaching other people how to have a relationship with Yeshua is a great way to please him. And in it, his children are most satisfied and fulfilled. No question about it. Nothing's like it. Nothing. Look, guys, I'm just here, and I get it. I understand it. There are possible causes of fear in relation to witnessing. And they include being shy. Some people are just shy. They're not comfortable about being intrusive. They're shy. A lot of people are shy. There's nothing wrong with that. Past or perceived rejection or humiliation. You know, Satan's always whispering to us, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're just annoying people. An inability to articulate one's own testimony. You, you don't, you, God's not asking you to be an orator or a great speaker. You know what God did for you. Let's tell him. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. 
by our testimony and not even caring about our life. Maybe a lack of knowledge of Scripture. We think we don't know much. I got to know more. They don't know nothing. The people you're talking to know nothing. So you know more than nothing. Sometimes it's just a failure to trust in the Lord. We don't realize how much depends on him and how little depends on us. We lift, he draws. He does the God stuff that we can't do. I mean, how many prayers over the centuries do you think have been offered to God? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of prayers, and yet we can't answer one of them. Determining the cause of the fear is probably going to be very hard and unnecessary, if you ask me. Understanding the reason may not dispel the fear. We're asked to be commanded to be bold, so we simply have to persevere. We just have to persevere one step at a time. I promise you, hand to God, the more you do it, the easier it gets. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Like anything, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And all of a sudden, what's going to happen is what's supernatural is going to come natural, and what's natural is going to become unnatural. The key to successful witnessing is love. I think Charles Spurgeon, yeah, Charles Spurgeon said, um, you can't be a winner of souls until you're a weeper of souls. God so loved the world. Don't memorize it. You've heard it so much that it's like, oh, really? Yes, really. God so loved the world. God so loved people that he gave the best a piece of himself covered with human flesh. Yeshua so loved people that he accepted the cross and separation from the Father. Do you realize it was separation? People say, oh no, he, God didn't forsake him. What? Well, well, The Bible said he didn't take on our sins. He became sin. So Yeshua became the pedophile. He became the adulterer. He became the murderer. He became the deadbeat dad. That's why God couldn't look at him. Why did he do that? Because he loved his father and he loved people. With the help of the Ruach, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can learn to love people more. When we do, we'll be so much more motivated to share the gospel since our desire to save people from eternal punishment will grow. Love compels us to communicate this good news. Our motto should be that none should perish. Two more scriptures, I promise we're done. Philippians 121, for to me, Paul, life is the Messiah and death is gain. Life is the Messiah and death is gain. Where do people focus? The second part, death is gain. They think about the joys of heaven. But we should not overlook what comes before it. The important phrase, life is the Messiah, cannot be overstated. In all honesty, this phrase should be central to every believer's life. The apostle is saying that the object of his life was to love, worship, and share Yeshua with others. From the time of his conversion in Acts 9 until his martyrdom in Rome, every move he made was aimed at advancing the knowledge of the gospel of Messiah Yeshua. And he said, follow me as I follow Yeshua. Colossians 4.3, pray for us, Paul says, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Messiah Yeshua. That is why I'm in chains. The Holy Spirit, I promise you guys, the Holy Spirit will open doors for us. And the Holy Spirit will convict people of their sin. And the Holy Spirit will stir a desire in them for salvation. And he will arrange our paths to cross. Our job is simple. It's just walk through those doors. Rabbi, what if he doesn't open up any doors today? Sit still. Darkness about going is light about staying. 
Don't put the pressure on yourself. Just look for the doors that the Spirit opens. If the Lord opens a door for us, then we can go through it with confidence, knowing that it is Him who's leading us. If we open the doors ourselves, we cannot be sure that we're in the center of God's will, and we might just stoop to carnal means. And if we stoop to cardinal means, there will be no fruitfulness, my friend, because God must get the glory. Once we walk through the door that the Holy Spirit opens, all we have to do is speak to those people and explain that salvation is available to every sinner and just present the good news of salvation. I usually ask this question. I don't have a... a a script, but I go, do you ever think about life after death? Everyone does. That's why people believe in aliens, zombies, and potential life on Mars. Because God put eternity in our mist. Nobody wants to believe this is it. I mean, it's crazy, right? A person spends their health trying to gain wealth. And then towards the end of the life, they use their wealth to gain health. And we don't learn from it. We keep chasing dopey things and wasting our life away. Storing up treasures, not in heaven. Rabbi, again, this is difficult to hear. I, this is not my opinion. Well, what's your take on life after death? I'm curious, and I'm not being a wise guy. I asked them, tell me about it. And I said, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not being difficult. I told the guy that came to the house, I said, I don't want to feel like I'm at a court date, and I don't want you to either. I'm not here to defend and beat you up because you're not going to submit anyway. I'm here talking to you. Like, relax. I'm trying to have a conversation with you, man. You know, you don't have to take out your sniper rifle. I'm just talking to you. Yes, I'm a man of faith and I want to share it with you, but I'm just talking to you. I'm not trying to get you to tap out. I always get the book in the hands. I'm telling you, it's invaluable, I promise you. 66 lousy little pages. And I tell them, I hear what your take is on heaven. Can I trust it? Can you trust my take on it? I would think we can only trust the one who came from heaven. He knows about heaven. See, we didn't come from heaven. We, we're here. We're trying to get to heaven. We don't even belong there. We got to get somebody to cover the bill, man. Somebody's got to pay the mortgage. Otherwise, you're foreclosed. I always get the book in their hands. If the person expresses no interest, at the very least, I planted some seeds, or God planted some seeds through me. Again, guys, I love you. I love you. I love you. I'm not going to be doing this forever. Who knows if I'll wake up tomorrow, but today, life is Messiah. I want you to know that we have a real enemy. He hates us. The only thing he hates more than us is the gospel. Don't give yourself too much credit. I don't think we offend him by reading. I just don't. I don't, I don't feel his hate vapors when I'm reading. I don't. In fact, when I'm reading the Bible, I feel very much at peace. I feel like he's not even there. And he doesn't run away because I'm reading the Bible. He's reading the Bible. I can't go near him. That's my kryptonite. No, it's not. I think when we're singing, I don't feel that he's upset. Who cares? I think when we attend church or synagogue, I don't think he gets flustered. I don't. These things are good in of themselves, but they're means to an end, but not offensive to Satan. When you try to snatch a soul out of his wicked little hands, that is offensive because they were sons of the devil. 
Rabbi, that, I got a son who's not a believer. How dare you call him that? Again, the Bible does. You can't have it both ways. You're either a son of God or a son of the devil. They were his. That kid is his. That's his property. And we just snatched him out of his wicked little hands and saved him from the fires of all eternity. I say let's become an enemy to the enemy. He's our enemy. I want to be his. I hate you. Hate me. I get it. I'm okay with it. I don't want you to like me, Satan. Don't ever let the world back you into a corner and force you to be a closet Christian. Come out, come out wherever you are. Don't allow the church to become the new bushel basket. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You're not a crack dealer or a pedophile. You're sharing great news and trying to save souls. What's there to be embarrassed of? The truth can be denied, but it cannot be disproved. They can't prove that to you. Know that going in. They could come up with all their cockamamie arguments. This guy finally said, I grew up in the South my whole life. I've heard this literally a thousand times in the 20 years I've lived here. A thousand times. And I've, I, my neighbor was a Christian. Or I used to go to church with these people. And I found out they were hypocrites. Yes, there are a lot of hypocrites. Yes, some of your witness sucks. You're one way in church and another way outside of church. And it's a lousy representation, and Yeshua deserves exceptional representation. But this is what I told him. You made a horrible mistake, a horrible mistake. You judged Yeshua based on his followers, but you never got to know him. Tell me, what do you know about him besides the fact that supposedly he died for the sins of the world? What do you know about him? Do you know where he was born? Do you know how he was raised? Do you know what he taught? Do you know what he believed? Wow, you know nothing about him, but you want nothing to do with him. I said, you come in here with your Arrow shirt, there's 300 Arrow employees, you're a jerk. Do I, am I allowed to say all Arrow employees are jerks? Is that even logical? That's what you're saying. But worse than that, you don't even know who you don't want to not know. It's crazy. Can I tell you a few things about him? I don't want to force you. He was the greatest devil. And he did for lousy, undeserving people what nobody could do or would do. I remember, <laughs> I'm sure you know this, when you're talking to somebody like I'm talking to you and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just kind of quickens you. I remember I was in Paradise Island. I was a really good swimmer. You know, I was a triathlete. And um, the waves were about seven foot that day and there was no lifeguard and there was a man who's holding a baby and he was trying to save his kid and I of course swam out there my kids were younger but I swam out there I got the kid I was swimming back and I was drowning I was taking on too much water because I had to keep this kid's head above water and I got to a point where I I was going to make it, but this one wave pushed me, and I just threw the kid, and the kid made it to shore. And when I got out of the water, I was so winded. I took on so much water. I just sat there for like 25 minutes. What if I would have drowned saving that kid? Don't you think that father might have had a little bit of an obligation to make sure my kids were okay? God drowned saving us. And although he resurrected, he went to Golgotha, he went to that cross on faith. Simply because he loved his dad and he loved us. And the father said, I'm pleased to crush my son. 
it actually makes me happy because Satan said check and through that I say checkmate. Yeah. He said that it made him happy because he would see his offspring. Yeah. Look at how many offspring there are just here over the centuries in the whole world. So in closing, I say study the word. The word, not Google. Stick your face in the Bible. Study the word. Live the believer's life. Be legit. Be legit. Nobody has to be perfect, but be legit. Stop living, well, I'm just a sinner. Let the Holy Spirit do his work and look for every dang opportunity to share the gospel. It's such a privilege to be part of spreading God's good news to the world. And keep in mind that as we fulfill the Great Commission, we have Yeshua's comforting promise. Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Therefore, we have nothing to fear. Let's stand together. God, I'm going to Memphis. They have the best barbecue, and I can't even eat it. This has been, I thought it was going to be easy not eating anything with taste or flavor. It's awful. Yesterday, I went to a Chinese restaurant, and they made steamed chicken and vegetables. You know what that tasted like? You have an idea? Steamed chicken? It, first of all, the smell was awful. But that's okay. I can handle the smell. I just told a few guys out there, I said I hit 65. I got this smell now. It's unbelievable. So I smell, my food smells. <laughs> Circle of life. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Yishmarecha Yor Aronoi Pono Velecha Vehunecha Yesa Adonoi Pono Velecha Via Sam Lecha Shalom Love you guys, Shabbat Shalom.